Hi, my name is Mike Gabin and welcome to Mission 34 of this KSB campaign. We are on our way back to the moon. Last episode concluded with me not fulfilling the return to the moon requirement of the Explore the Moon contract. This mission is designed to polish this off, and a whole lot more. Indeed, if you glance at the Contracts Plus window on the right, you will see six contracts, and that's not the end of it. Also this episode you'll be seeing two other missions polish off three more contracts. That's a total of nine contracts that will be completed this episode, and yes, I did say completed. There won't be any loose ends this time. We've got a lot going on, so let's not waste any more time and take a closer look at this vehicle. At 187 tons, this now becomes my biggest and most expensive launch to date. The vessel is currently being pushed by five skipper engines, which provide a launch thrust of 2,611 kilonewtons, and is lifting a payload in excess of 30 tons, which we'll be looking at in detail shortly. The lifter features just one new part, but it is an important one. This is my first vessel to feature the launch escape system, which is designed to rocket the crew capsule safely away from the rest of the vehicle in case a mishap occurred during ascent. You want to attach the activation of the escape tower with the abort action group in the VAB. Don't forget to also trigger the appropriate decoupler. You trigger an abort by hitting backspace on your keyboard or clicking on the abort button, which appears when you hover over the game's altimeter. Besides providing a means of escape for your Kerbals, the launch abort systems just flat out looks cool. I just wish the stock game had a .625 meter version for the Mark I command pod. As the escape tower is only held on by a docking port, I also added a few struts to strengthen the connection. As you can see, pilot the thing, we have Valentina Kerman, and completing our crew is our scientist Jaring and our engineer Jer Berry. This represents the first mission for these two since they were rescued in episodes 10 and 14 respectively. Okay, let's take a look at all the contracts we've got. As mentioned, the last one, Explore the Moon, is a leftover from last episode, but the rest are all new. Starting off, we have two observational survey contracts, each of which are packed with a cluster of waypoints over which we have to do crew reports. Next is to plant a flag on the moon, which obviously requires us getting down onto the surface. Contract number three is to conduct temperature surveys both in low orbit and on the surface. Finally, second from the bottom, we have to build a station around the moon. Although I have every intention of bringing this vehicle back to Kerbin, this vessel does meet the necessary requirements for this station contract. I have the details of each contract hidden for now only because there are so many of them. We'll take a look at the details of each when it comes time to perform them. Our altitude is now over 60 kilometers. Time to get rid of the abort tower. I've attached the activation of the tower and the decoupling of the node to a general action group, which I can now do thanks to my recently fully upgraded VAB. I added a couple of backward facing separatrons to push the heavy lifter away after staging. The lifter won't be recovered and will be destroyed in the atmosphere. With LKO now established, it's time to take a detailed look at the vehicle which these three will be calling home for the next week or so. The vehicle is composed of two stages. The lower stage should have enough fuel to get us into a low lunar orbit and begin our descent. That way, when it's staged, it'll just crash into the surface of the moon, removing any debris. All told, this thing has a little over 3 kilometers per second of delta V, which should easily be enough to get us down to the surface of the moon and back to Kerbin. The lower stage features two new parts, the X200-16 fuel tank and the RE-1110 Poodle liquid fuel engine. With a vacuum ISP of 350 seconds, the Poodle is the most efficient chemical engine in the game. Just don't use it inside an atmosphere. The upper stage is being pushed by a set of four Terrier engines, which I chose mostly because the medium-sized landing struts have difficulty extending past the larger Poodle engine. But I would say its most distinctive feature is the newly unlocked 2.5 meter service bay. This is a great part. You can fit so much into it. You may be noticing the materials bay is in here, as well as a whole ton of batteries. I'll be getting to why I've got so many batteries shortly. Also in the service bay is the most recently unlocked science part, the double C seismic accelerometer, which will help increase this and future science halls. 
All three of our crew members are being housed in the Mark 1-2 command pod, the game's Apollo-style three-crew capsule. Below that is the game's 2.5 meter heat shield to protect our crew module upon re-entry. Unlike the Ares, which took Jeb, Bill, and Bob to the moon previously, this is a one-off vehicle, which I think provides a nice contrast in mission design with the Ares. With the addition of the crew cabin up top, I have a vehicle that can house up to five Kerbals. I decided to go with just three crew, even though the entire crew compartment will be returning to Kerbin's surface. Val and company are going to be entering a polar orbit. One, because I have a number of near space surveys to do, but two, I want to leave them in orbit until they pass over and collect EVAs from all the remaining biomes of the moon. This will take several days, so I figure they would appreciate the extra space to stretch out in. Now, the eagle eye viewer may have spotted with the mission number at the start, that I skipped a couple of missions. Indeed, so before Val, Jaring, and Jer Barry reach their closest approach and execute the Mooner capture, why don't we briefly take a look at the fruits of those other two missions? It's not too often you see the conclusion of a mission before its start, but this was all accomplished using vessels you've seen before, so I thought I'd cut to the chase. Meet our newest recruits, Oregon, Haddon, and Cowley, and yes, they're all scientists. After being so excited a couple of episodes ago rescuing my first scientist, it turns out I'm now swimming in them. Haddon and Cowley were picked up from low Kerbin orbit using a freshly launched 27M racer. With the three crewed Mark 1-2 command capsule now unlocked, I could easily build a more typical LKO ferry, but I've grown rather attached to this thing. Goodness knows it's cheap. I think I'll keep it around for a while yet. This mission is remarkably similar to the double LKO rescue you saw a couple of episodes ago performed by an identical vessel to this one. The main difference is that this mission started from the surface of Kerbin instead of Kier Station, and unfortunately I did a rather poor job timing my ascent, trying to squeak in below and behind my first target. Our orbits are so similar it would have taken a long time to catch up to Cowley, so I decided to switch targets to Haddon and raise my orbit to allow him to catch up to me. I could have thought this out better though. Haddon is on the opposite side of the planet from my current position. And then it's to Cowley, again on the opposite side of Kerbin. And finally, as I have a third rescue still to make, I wanted to go to Kier Station, which is behind me and in a higher altitude orbit. With only a few hundred meters per second of Delta V to play with, this took a while. So as you can see here, I'm back at the station with only 15 meters per second left in the tanks and two days and four hours on the mission clock. Oh well. All's well that ends well. As for our third rescue, while well, the racer wasn't going to be able to get there, Oregon was about 4,000 kilometers out, and an orbit inclined at around 25 degrees. This is a job for Jeb, Bill, and Bob in the Ares. For a vessel capable of landing on the moon and returning, provided I can manage a decently efficient landing, this mission shouldn't be a problem. Refueling the Ares pretty much emptied that upper fuel tanker, which was good. I was getting tired of looking at that ugly thing. Once again, you've seen me do these kinds of missions before, so I won't spend much time with it, other than pointing out, once again, to make the inclination change away from the parent body to save fuel. In this case, I combined the plane change with a pro-grade burn setting up my phasing orbit. Combining burns when you can is often a good idea, too. This got Jeb and company meeting up with Oregon about just after a couple of days. As I was approaching Oregon's shipwreck, I was really hoping for an engineer. That would have given me four of each of the three classes. But as you already know, Oregon was just another scientist. Either way, I think I'll stop accepting these rescue contracts. With a core of 12 Kerbinauts, I've got enough to do me for a while. Of course, once the Ares was docked with the station just a day and a half later, Oregon was transferred over to the waiting racer, which brings us to where we started. With a routine recovery and a brief look at my expanded roster, it was time to get back to the main mission. As we fall in towards our closest approach and capture, let's take a closer look at the first of the contracts we'll be polishing off. 
The first set of requirements are pretty typical for a station contract, antenna, docking port, power generation, and the ability to hold five kerbals. But if you take a look at the third requirement, you will see that I require having 2,500 units of electrical charge on board. And with having only unlocked the two smallest batteries, well, it meant I had to have a lot of them. <laughs> Thank goodness for the big 2.5 meter service bay. As you can see, all but one requirement is green. The only thing left is to get my capture and wait for the required 10 seconds. There we go. One down, five to go. Next up are some observational surveys. These ones here are the first coming up. Looking for a name. Werner's Flat. Okay, which one's that one? Oh, here it is. The lowest one requires being under an altitude of seven kilometers. Some orbital tweaking will be required, but I won't bore you with all that. Simply cut ahead to conducting the final crew report. Okay, there are two of these coming up pretty close together. Come on. Okay, there's the first one. All right, that should be one. Now we just got to wait on the next one. There it is. Got, oh, yes. All right, that's it. So contract complete. All right, so what's up next? Tri rods hindsight. Oh, hang on. These are temperature surveys. I only have one of these types of contracts. Okay, so we got five of these. But two of them are on the surface. Okay, I'm coming up to this one first. So we'll uh, activate that waypoint. In that one, then we're going to be hitting this one, and that one's in near space. And that one's in near space. Oh, and those last two. Okay, and then there's two real close together here on the surface. Oh, I think I'm going to be hitting hitting these in a pretty good order. Indeed, after picking up the first two, and then a further small orbital tweak, don't forget that radial components to the burn can be used to move the periapsis and apoapsis to different locations in the orbit. On day three of the mission, Jaring picked up the third temperature scan. Now it's time to get down to the surface. Yeah, this is looking pretty good, I think, on the next orbit. I think I'll get these. Well, there they are. Oh, they're both looking like they're in that crater. And that second one looks like it's on a slope. Well, <laughs> we'll see what we get. Trying to pull my trajectory eastward while I deorbit. Oh, geez, I'm going to have to come a lot more eastward than that no more retrograde just uh just east bring it a little bit to the east of the waypoint because the moon's still going to rotate a little bit yeah i think so uh, i think that's looking all right okay so we got 27 meters per second left in this stage the idea was for this stage to crash into the surface, so this is working out just as planned. Alright, stage away. We got another 1800 meters per second left to land and then get back to Kerbin. I've got two waypoints though. And they look further apart than last time. Worst comes to worst, I can do what I did last episode and send a spare tank of fuel to help get them back. That alone gives a good reason to always put a docking port on your ships, but I think Val would prefer to show up Jeb and do this without the need of further resource support. Oh, kind of like this sort of a crater inside a crater, and both of those two waypoints seem to be on the outer part of the crater. That far one doesn't seem to be as quite as sloped as I was worried it was going to be. Now, last time I spent a lot of time fiddling with my descent. I don't want to do that this time. I want to try and land a little bit more efficiently. So we'll go for that uh, waypoint coming up first. First, that makes sense. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I'm coming a little bit short now. Shoot, okay. Thrust a little bit this way. There we go. All right, we're just over 20 seconds from impact, according to better burn time, so uh, we'll make this 
time to get serious. Now the estimated burn to come to a stop is about five seconds, but I don't want to cut it that tight. So I do want to keep my time to impact above that estimated burn time down there by the nav ball. Oh, we're blinking now. So let's just get down to the surface. I'm beginning to see the lights on the surface. Oh, we're just a few seconds away. Okay, okay, okay. Whoa, whoa, we're coming straight down. And there's the shadow. And touch. Beautiful. All right. Okay, that waypoint's not blinking, but that one is. So we're within the one waypoint there. We'll do ourselves our temperature scan. Where's that thermometer? There we go. Log temperature. All right. Well, won't keep that one because we've got to do another one. In fact, I'll just pin this over here to the right because we're going to do another one in just a moment. Okay, we're going to do ourselves a little bit of a hop. The other waypoint is 1.4 kilometers away. I think it's pretty much to the north, so we'll just pitch over to the north. Oh, there's the waypoint for the temperature scan on the way, so we'll just aim at that. Alright, hopefully that will give us a nice parabolic trajectory over there. Now I don't need to get right to the waypoint. I just want to get close enough for it to start blinking so that I can do my temperature scan. Um, oh, we're starting to come down now. Yeah, I think I, I think I'm coming short. Okay, okay, okay. Let's uh, thrust up a little bit so we'll carry a little bit further. Oh, oh, okay. We're blinking. Let's get down. Let's get down. Let's get down. All right. Oh, we're really close to the surface. What we got? Oh, we're going pretty much just sideways. Got to kill off this horizontal velocity. All right, that should be about it. Okay, we're falling. And again, I'm really just watching better burn time in those, you know, time to impact and my estimated burn. They're really, there we go. Touch. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stay up, stay up, stay up. Okay, okay, we're sliding. And <laughs> we're stopped. Oh, this is a little bit more slope than I thought it was. Okay, we're good. Uh, temperature scan. All right, it's 29 science, and we'll, we'll transmit this. Might as well, and we'll get uh, sharing out to uh, recollect all that stuff. But that's the contract complete, so we can uh, get rid of this guy. All right, next up, we're going to plant a flag on the moon. But I think before we do all that, we'll just get all the science that we can. We'll use the X science window for this, because we've got a lot of science to collect. Oh, we're in the lowlands. Crew report, transmit that. I don't, I'm, I've landed a uncrewed probe and another crewed landing, and neither of those was in the lowlands, so it just should be a nice, healthy amount of science for us to collect. You know, with 2,500 units of electrical power on board, certainly don't have to worry about electricity this time. All right, and that leaves our newest equipment the seismic scan oh my gosh got 72 science from this one and we'll transmit 45 for now and of course we'll do another one and of course jaring will come out in a little bit and uh, he'll collect as much science as we can from this biome but why don't we get to val coming out so we can plant the flag oh geez well, how is this gonna work uh, let go, I guess. Okay, RCS, RCS. No, no, oh, oh. Geez, sorry, Val. Oh, these auspicious first steps are not going very well. <laughs> I do have the small ladder segments unlocked now. Maybe providing one to stand on wouldn't have been a bad idea. Oh, well, maybe Jaring can uh, make a better show of this. So, there we go. EVA. Okay, let's try climbing down as far as we can first before letting go. Okay, that's it. So let go. RCS. Oh, oh yeah. That's the ticket. You know, grace is important, you know. 
And with Jerberry joining the crew on the surface, before we plant the flag, I want to point something out. That facial animation glitch that I've been seeing the last couple of episodes, it has been fixed. It was apparently a DirectX thing. But the latest patch from Texture Replacer Replace seems to have squashed that bug. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. Okay, uh, message time. Okay, mission 34, Val, Jerberry, and I momentarily have forgotten his name. Oh, yeah, Jering. <laughs> How come we don't get no Greek god name for our ship? Ooh, nice misspelling there, even. You know how the rest of this goes. Jaring and Jerberry will also plant a flag for the experience, and then we'll squeeze out all the science that we can from the moon's lowlands before it's time for us to be heading out of here. Let's check our notifications first. Plant a flag. Our trackers confirm the flag has been planted at the moon. Nicely done. Man, that's a heck of a telescope they got there. And the ones for the temperature surveys. Okay, let's get out of here. Now I still have some more orbital crew reports to get. So we're going back into a polar orbit. We'll cut engines a little early as we're going to be coming up to these waypoints almost right away. And I want to keep my altitude low. I grabbed the first two crew reports before even doing a single orbit. With over 400 meters per second left in the vehicle, I was feeling confident enough to do a 45 meter per second normal correction, moving back my orbit after missing the final target. With day three drawing to a close, that final crew report was performed, leaving just to the Explore the Moon contract left to complete. The only requirement of which remaining was to return this vessel safely to Kerbin's surface. That was going to have to wait another couple of days for the plane of our orbit to line up with the moon's orbit around Kerbin. However, that afforded Jerry the opportunity to pick up the final near space EVA over the southwest crater. Well done, sir. We'll transmit that home. And that, according to X Science, is 17 of 17 biomes. Awesome. All right, it's homeward bound. No arrow breaking into low orbit this time. There we go, periapsis, 31 kilometers, that'll do. I'm not sure if folks have noticed this during the episode, but I've changed my skybox. This one is made by Gallimissile. I do hope I'm saying that right. This is the first time I'm using a skybox that doesn't have the galaxy at an inclination of zero. It was always a rather convenient point of reference, but this skybox is so pretty I had to go with it. I swear those are the Pleiades over there. This is also a good time for an announcement. I'm going to be putting this series on hold for a bit. This is so that I can concentrate on finishing off my other heavily modded series, which has been on hiatus since the summer when I realized that trying to maintain two series at the same time was too much for me. I figure that that series has got another half dozen episodes in it, after which I'll be coming back here. As for now, after recovery, I now have 656 science and over 1.8 million curb bucks. Oh, a milestone! We have returned home from the surface of the moon. Well, actually, Lanford already did that last episode, but okay. The Explore the Moon contract is now complete. Our explorations of moon, the moon was. <laughs> moon was, yeah, it's a good thing we were on moon was. Uh, successful, but who knows what other secrets it holds. In the R&D center, I went with advanced electrics for a bigger battery and some deployable solar panels. Heavier rocketry for the mainsail and bore liquid fuel booster. Some great tools for lifting heavier payloads. Then came specialized construction for 2.5 meter fairings, some nice construction parts, and the 1.25 meter docking port. And finally came advanced fuel systems for some larger fuel tanks. And with 2.1 million curb books now flooding the coffers after restocking my contracts, I decided to upgrade the tracking station to level 3, which ups the deep space network from 50 to 250 G, as well as allowing me to begin tracking near curb and asteroids. I've got lots of options as to what to do next, but as I said, it will be a while until the next episode. In the meantime, 
I hope to see you for the final episodes of my other series, and as always, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.